Good afternoon, everybody. Today is National Thank a Teacher Day, and I'd like to start by doing just that. Our teachers, indeed all of our staff, working across all education and childcare settings, have really stepped up to meet the current challenges that we face. Thousands of them have been going into school to look after the children of critical workers and our most vulnerable children. And many more of them have been supporting students to continue their learning remotely and helping parents to do that as well. In fact, a survey by ParentKind found that 84% of Welsh parents were satisfied with the support that they had recently received from their schools. And other professionals right across the nation, well, they've been coming forward with ideas for what we do next and ensuring that they can get back to doing what they do best when it is safe to do so. So a huge, a massive, diolchan vawg, massive thank you from me. Now, last Friday, I published our decision framework for the next phase of education and childcare. I did this to be as open as possible on what issues that we're considering and how we will come to decisions on these critical matters. As I said last week, I will make the decisions on how and when more pupils in Wales will return to school. And I will only do that when I am assured it is the right time and it is the right thing to do. But let us be clear, we are facing huge challenges across the whole of our education sector due to the coronavirus outbreak. So this afternoon, we are publishing our resilience plan for post-16 education. The plan sets out how we will work with our colleges, universities and training providers to overcome the challenges that we currently face. Since education providers in Wales closed to face-to-face -face learning on March the 20th, colleges and universities have moved to delivering online lectures, tutorials and reviews, as well as ensuring that they continue to support our most vulnerable learners. This afternoon's plan is divided into three phases. The current rescue phase is very much focused on ensuring education providers have immediate security of funding and arrangements for learning are in place for the rest of this academic year. The review phase of the plan looks for potential changes that will need to be in place this autumn. And the renew phase will put arrangements in place for the remainder of the academic year 2020-2021. Importantly, the plan also identifies learners for whom the coronavirus is likely to cause the most disruption, including year, year 11 and year 13, and a raft of vocational learners who need to access colleges or workplaces to complete their courses. I'm also very pleased to announce today £1.3 million of capital funding as part of our SARE Cymru programme. This money will be used to pump prime and support research that could contribute to or boost the advancement of research related to COVID-19. This could cover areas such as virology and immunology, as well as behavioural science and the wider impact of the pandemic. Our colleges, universities and training providers are critical to our national response to coronavirus, but they will also be critical to the rebuilding of our economy and to continuing to play an essential role in their host communities. Now, before I take questions from uh, our colleagues, uh, the journalists, if any parent has further questions they'd like to ask me today, I will be available to answer between 5 and 6 p.m. this evening, live on Facebook and Twitter. So just use the hashtag AskKirsty. And I'll now turn to questions. And first today, we have uh, Bethan Lewis from BBC Wales. Good afternoon, Bethan. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Minister. When it comes to reopening schools uh, in England, we've seen uh, some unions, some councils opposing the UK government's approach. If you decide to reopen schools before the summer break, are you confident that you will have the backing of teaching unions in doing that? Or is there potential for the sort of conflict and tensions we've seen in England? Uh, well, Bethan, we are working very closely with all key stakeholders as we make the, the next uh, decisions around what happens next for education in Wales. You'll be aware in the framework document that we published last week, we have a middle tier group where our local authorities are, are represented. 
the professional body that, uh, that represents the views of directors of education uh, are, are meeting with uh, colleagues in Welsh Government on a regular basis. I myself meet with the leader of the WLGA and the lead for education uh, of the WLGA on a weekly basis. And indeed, on Friday, I will be meeting with a larger group of uh, political uh, education portfolio holders. So we're working very closely together. Uh, the unions are also closely attuned uh, to the work that we, are, that we are doing. And what's crucial to me as we think about how we can find and develop the, the evidence and the confidence and the control that we will need over the disease before we make next steps, that working together, that's a crucial part of building confidence. Thank you. Um, the plan that you've uh, published today for post-16, it mentions the fact that about a quarter of learners aren't engaging with the remote learning up to the benchmark that FE colleges have set. That's an issue for schools as well. What information do you have on the number of children that just aren't engaging in the remote learning going on at the moment? And if it, this is going to be you know, an element of education in the medium to longer term, how are you going to make sure that every child has access to that education? Well, you're right, continuity of learning, whether that be pre or post 16, is really important. And we need to work with providers to ensure that any barriers to students and children participating in learning are removed. Uh, that's why we've already announced a multi-million pound package of uh, support to tackle the issue of digital exclusion, ensuring that children at home who currently do not have a device to engage in digital learning have a device, and also uh, trying to tackle some of the issues around connectivity by supplying MiFi devices to children who don't have internet access at home. We are working with the FE sector to look to de develop similar proposals uh, for those uh, in, uh, in FE. And as we go forward, just this week, we published a expectations document about how we expect schools to be engaging uh, with parents to uh, support the continuity of learning. And we will be developing a raft of ways in which we can get assurance from that. Uh, Estin also uh, have already begun to publish case studies in how particular parts of the se sector are responding to the challenges we face, and they will continue to do that as we develop good practice, because I think you're absolutely right, Bethan. As we move forward, we will continue to see a blend of traditional classroom approaches when we can get more children back to school, but digital learning is going to be an important part of what we continue to do, and we're starting from a very good base in Wales because of our investment in the Hub platform, and every week we see uh, hundreds of thousands of children log on to that platform. Uh, next, we're going to move to, I believe, Adrian Masters at ITV Wales. Good afternoon, Adrian. Good afternoon, Minister. Could I pick up on um, Beth Ann's first question? And um, you said that, um, uh, the, the, well, effectively, you said that relations between your government and the teaching unions here in Wales is, is better than, certainly better than the reports of uh, the relationship in England. Does that better working relationship mean that a return to schools is more likely to happen uh, at, a, at a sooner date here in Wales that, that, than it would elsewhere? And given that you've said that there will be three weeks notice which would take us uh, to the middle of June, I think. Can, can, can you, if not, tell us when schools will begin to reopen? At least, can you tell us when that you might tell us the date, if you see what I mean? I think I see what you mean, Adrian. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I didn't say that we have a better relationship with England. It's not for me to comment on the relationship that unions have with uh, Gavin Williamson in England. What I'm describing is a very positive relationship that we have uh, with our unions representing the entirety of the education workforce here, uh, in, uh, here in Wales. And we work very closely with them because, of course, uh, when we make a decision to go back I into schools or to allow more children to go back to schools, those uh, the, the members of those unions will be the people that have to operationalise that uh, decision. And therefore, we need to build confidence amongst parents, but also confidence about the workforce that it is safe uh, to go back. 
Adrian, as I said on Friday, I will not set an arbitrary date for when more children will go back into Welsh schools. I have been as clear as I can be that at this stage we need more evidence about the progression of the pandemic and the disease. We need more confidence uh, around some of that evidence and to build confidence amongst key stakeholders. And we need more control over the disease. So for instance, whilst we can do planning in education, we also need to see the development of the test, trace and protect regime uh, as well. That's a crucial key part of enabling more children to go back uh, to school. I will not set an arbitrary date. We've only heard this morning from the BMA about how unhelpful that is, and we've heard from the World Health Organization about how, help, uh, how unhelpful it is. But let me be clear, when a decision is made to have more of our children return to school, you will hear that directly from me. Second question, Adrian. Um, if I could uh, pick up on something in, in your resilience document, um, you talk about the potential serious financial hit um, for colleges and universities. Um, and in particular, that's because of a, a, a lack of international students or a possible lack of international students. The Russell Group today has called for uh, amongst other actions, visa waivers um, to be introduced in order to, to help out. With universities and college facing financial hit that could even lead to bankruptcy, what, what more can you say about what your government is doing to try to uh, cushion the blow and help them through? Well, you're right to say that uh, we are concerned about the, poten the potential impact of COVID-19 on our ability to recruit international students uh, to uh, universities in Wales and to ensure that those students from overseas that have already started courses uh, will come back uh, to complete. Uh, the issue of visas is an important uh, one. I would agree with the Russell Group. Uh, that is not a devolved matter and we continue to make representations uh, to colleagues in the Westminster government for whom they do have control over visas to ensure that there are no barriers in place that would stop the recruitment of uh, uh, international students. Here in Wales, we're working very closely with the Higher Education Funding Council as well as Universities Wales and our Vice Chancellors. We've taken some immediate steps to respond to the immediate financial pressures that the HE sector uh, is facing. And we continue to work with the Funding Council to identify uh, what, what we can do next to support the HE sector uh, going uh, forward whether, uh, uh, and what we can do to ensure that hopefully at the start of the ne next academic year, our universities will be in a great place to be able to continue to offer what they do, which is a great student and educational experience. Could any of them go bankrupt? Well, uh, at this stage, I have not received any information from the Higher Education Funding Council that any of our institutions uh, are, are facing uh, immediate uh, a crisis. But it's absolutely correct to say that the sector is facing some significant challenges, uh, as is every single part of uh, you know, of the economy and of the public sector. And universities are no exception to that. And that's why we're working really, really closely with them to identify what support is needed, when it's needed, and how that can be delivered equitably to protect, as I said, the high quality institutions that we have here in Wales. Uh, we're now going to move on to Will. Will Hayward at Wales Online. Thank you very much. If a young person was planning to start or already had started an apprenticeship, their employer has closed and doesn't know when they're going to reopen. Can you just explain to them what exactly they should do? Well, this is a, a particular uh, challenge, and that's why uh, we will need to work with both employers and the FE sector to look at ways in which we can continue to support that young person in their training uh, journeys. So for some, it might be returning to a full-time education course whilst their employer is not able to provide the, the work element of, of that placement. But we're working very closely uh, with our work-based learning providers, employers, and our FE colleges, so we can respond ap appropriately to each individual student's uh, re requirements at this time. Thank you. And if I was a year 11 student starting college in the autumn or a uni university student starting in September, can you tell me exactly how my experience is going to be different to previous years? And how many students do you anticipate deferring their university entries this year? And how much money could that cost our institutions? Well, uh, well, well I wish I was in a position uh, to be able to say exactly what that experience is going to look like. Uh, I don't think there is, uh, there is anybody 
that is able to look that far ahead to September to say exactly what it's going to look like. Uh, what's really important uh, is that we continue at this stage to provide ongoing advice to Year 11 students about options that will be available to them and to Year 13 students who are looking to go on uh, to universities. Uh, we're working across those sectors to try and ensure that what is available is high quality and clearly is safe to do so, uh, so that people have confidence in being able to make those choices. Uh, I am particularly concerned that we give a really good experience to Year 11 students uh, for whom this has been a really challenging time. So we are working, for instance, with Careers Wales to make sure that we have an enhanced offer on Results Day uh, to be able to help ch uh, students make really good choices. Uh, and over the next week, Careers Wales will be holding an online question and answer session for parents who are also looking for advice at this time. Sorry, should they be expecting to do most of their work remotely? And via video. Uh, I suspect we're going to be looking at a situation of blended learning. We've already seen some institutions uh, talk about moving lectures uh, online, uh, but actually continuing to do small group work and tutorials on a face-to-face -face basis. Uh, as I said, we have uh, included in our planning work both representatives of the FE sector and representatives of universities so that we can work together to ensure that what we are able to offer in the new academic year is safe and secure, but it is also high quality. But I think it's absolutely right to say that we will be continuing to look at a blended approach to learning as we move forward. Uh, we're now going to go to Mark Hutchins at Five Live. Thank you, Minister. Sorry, jumped up the order there. Um, good afternoon. Uh, well, on the point about universities, uh, some universities elsewhere um, have uh, said that uh, they looked uh, to September and beyond and stated that um, for the whole academic year, or at least part of it, uh, all teaching will be online. So do you expect Welsh universities to follow suit? And how on earth does any potential student know what they're signing up for? Well, Mark, as you know, universities are autonomous bodies. We can't dictate to universities at how they deliver their programmes uh, of learning. Uh, what will be important is that students are well cited in advance of what that experience uh, will be. And I expect the quality regime bodies and the Higher Education Funding Council for Wales to be very explicit when dealing with the universities about being very clear to potential students what their experience will look like academically and how their health and safety will be addressed. And as far as schools are concerned, a couple of weeks ago, the First Minister suggested one possibility was that uh, children uh, in Welsh medium schools uh, from an English-speaking background, an English-speaking home, uh, might be among the first to return. Is that still under consideration in the policy that might, uh, some might see, see as potentially divisive? Well, Mark, I published on Friday uh, our framework document, which highlighted priority groups of students who could be the first uh, to go uh, back into our schools. We do recognise absolutely that for English-speaking parents who've made a very positive choice to educate their children uh, through the medium of Welsh, this can be a particularly challenging time to support their education. And in response to that, we have published additional resources, help and advice on our hub platform to support parents who find themselves uh, in this position. Do you accept it would be divisive for Welsh uh, medium pupils to go back before English medium pupils? As I said, we've published on Friday uh, our priority groups. What we need to do is to address issues around continu continuity of learning for all uh, of, of our children. Uh, the medium of that education, uh, we talked earlier about digital exclusion, the challenges of working parents trying to work at home and educate their children. We have to look at the education of all of our children uh, in uh, the round. The principle of equity has always been really important to me and it will continue to be important to me as we make decisions going forward. We're now going to go to Adam, I believe, Adam Hale at uh, PA. Thank you, uh, Minister. Your messaging on schools has gone down a lot better than it has done in England in terms of uh, teacher safety. Um, but even though no dates for a return have been officially muted by the Welsh Government, and the cautious approach has been praised by, by teachers, it seems. Isn't it right and proper to say that until a vaccine is found or this virus burns out, uh, that you will not be able to guarantee teacher safety in Wales when they do return to a classroom? Uh, let me be absolutely clear. Uh, the decision that, that I took 
to end statutory provision in our schools and any decision I take with regards to the next phases of education at the forefront of my mind will be the health and the emotional well-being of our staff our, and our children. And we will have to recognise that in any environment it's impossible to give 100% guarantees. There isn't any aspect of our life where we can give 100% guarantees. But what is incumbent upon me and those that have the responsibility of delivering education is that we manage those risks as much as possible and we create an environment that is as safe as it possibly can be so that we can allow more children uh, to go back to school. Those are some very practical things that we may be able to do within a school setting, how we organise the school day, but it also goes beyond education. For instance, I spoke earlier about the need to establish a really robust test, trace and protect programme so that when, if we have got more children in school, they're supported by really strong public health measures. So we can't eliminate all risk, but we can do our very best to minimise that risk and to provide confidence and the infrastructure to manage risk. Thank you. And uh, provisions have been made for uh, school pupils to continue learning at home during the crisis. Uh, but the reality is that uh, for many, many pupils in education, uh, primary and secondary education, will perhaps not have engaged with it, have been able to engage with it. And by the time they do return to the classroom, they could be way behind in terms of their academic progress. Can you update parents uh, about what they can perhaps expect from the classroom uh, to counteract this widening gap in their kids' education when they do return? Well, firstly, can I say, I absolutely accept that we cannot replicate in a kitchen the experience that a child has uh, within uh, the classroom. And I think for many parents, myself included, you know, we all have a renewed respect for the, uh, for the teaching profession uh, and what a challenging but rewarding job uh, that it is. Uh, as I outlined in my document last week, not only are we thinking and preparing for the very practical considerations of more children returning to school, we also have to think about the pedagogical preparations for more children going back to school, addressing their mental health and well-being. For some children, it might be a real shock to go back into the, into the classroom, but also to address issues around learning loss. And we're working with our educationalists to develop, as I said, not only guidance around the practical implications of going back to school, but also the education educational approaches of what we need to do when we get more children back to school. We we'll also need to concentrate on continuing to develop our expertise in remote learning because I do anticipate we will continue to have a blended approach uh, as, we, as we move forward and therefore making sure that all children can access that and the experience that they have a good quality is an important part of the ongoing work that we're doing, that we're doing now, uh, supported by our school improvement services and our inspector of schools. We are now going to uh, Tom Moody at South Wales Argus. Uh, um, I'm concerned about the effect the pandemic will have on uh, universities in Wales, especially with um, the economic impact of thousands of students uh, not coming into Wales for the next academic year or to burn their studies um, for a further year. Yes, of course. Uh, of, of course, we're very alive to the real risks and challenges faced by our HE sector at the moment. And that's why, as I said earlier, we're working very closely with the Higher Education Funding Council and University Wales to support them through this, uh, support them through this time. I don't know if you have a follow up, Tom. If not, we're going to move to Nathan, no, Nathan uh, Shoesmith, uh, this speaker. Nathan. repeatedly thought about both today and in the document you've released today about a blended learning approach. Uh, some students um, either currently at Welsh universities or applying to Welsh universities will be wondering will they be going to student accommodation from the autumn? Now I know this will be <laughs> somewhat confusing for everyone and you can't give a definitive answer but if you're considering a blended learning approach is there anything you can say to reassure students at this 
Uh, well, it's really, really difficult at this stage. Uh, and as I said, uh, universities are autonomous bodies, and I'm certainly not responsible for how they uh, operate their accommodation system. What I can say is that we're including them in, uh, in our work around uh, planning for next phases so that they can use the information that we have, access to the scientific advice that we have that can plan their work. But at this stage, it really uh, is impossible for me to say what that uh, higher education experience will look like. But we will want to be concerned, as I said, about health uh, and safety, but we will also want to be concerned about quality of that education going forward. But at this stage, uh, certainly, too early for, for me to say, and in many ways, as autonomous bodies, it's up to individual universities to put those plans in place and to communicate those plans to their prospective students. Can we now go on to Tom Magna at uh, Carers World Radio, please? Tom. Thank you very much indeed, Minister. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, can I widen this out a little bit? Uh, last week, it's been reported that blind people were being shouted at for not social distancing. Today we hear that young carers in Wales are being shouted at and turned away from shops. Charities, charities are saying this is a rare occurrence, but our viewers, frankly, are saying it's not. What's going wrong in your view? Well, I was shocked to hear stories today about a young carer who was doing the food shopping for her mum, who I believe has epilepsy, who had been turned away. Tom, this week is Mental Health Awareness Week, and the theme for the week is kindness. And I think as we all struggle to get to grips with what our new lives look like, we could always do with remembering to be a little bit kind and not to make assumptions. If you see that child in the shop, if you see a person with a disability who you perceive is not following the rules, there may be a very good reason. So I would urge everybody in Wales, please, at this time, be kind. And finally, we move to Dan Moffat at Atrium News. Thank you, Minister. Firstly, we know that all universities in Wales are expecting a lower number of new students in September. But how are schools in Wales advising students heading for university? Are they telling their students to accept offers and see what the situation is in September? Or are they advising them to maybe take a year out and return when conditions and teaching are likely to be safer and at a higher quality? Uh, well, well, Dan, I think this is really a, a situation where each individual student and their family will have to make decisions for themselves, having consulted with the university that they want to go to. Uh, what's really important to me is that we're seeing a shift of resources in Careers Wales. Traditionally, on Results Day, Careers Wales has focused on GCSE Results Day. Uh, we're actually increasing the resource and increasing the help available for our Year 13s uh, on Results Day so that they can have some professional, impartial uh, advice. And for Year 13s, think of going to university uh, then there are additional resources on hub uh, to keep them learning at this time and to give them uh, experiences about pre preparation for university but it really is for each student and family uh, to make those decisions oh, we've got one from Dan at oh uh, we have one more from Dan at global I understand Dan uh, thank you health uh, sorry, education minister <laughs> better late than never um, can I start by asking about uh, children who live near the Welsh and England uh, border, uh, perhaps they go to uh, school in one country and live in another. What government advice, which government advice should they be following, the one where they live or the one where they go to school? Well, I'm aware that we do have uh, residents of Wales whose children access education in England. You'll be uh, familiar with the regulations in Wales that provide exceptions for, for travel, excuses, reasons which uh, are legitimate for travelling and leaving your home. And uh, I would recognise that travelling to a place of education would be a reasonable uh, excuse uh, to leave your home. But ultimately, it is for each parent to, to decide uh, if they want their child to return to school. Uh, but travelling to school would be covered by the exceptions to the stay-at-home rules. Thank you. And if I could just ask one further question. Uh, you've been adamant uh, yeah, again today that you won't reopen schools until it's safe to do so. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the, uh, until the element of risk is, uh, is low, but uh, perhaps in schools, the element of risk is going to be higher than in other workplaces. Can you guarantee that all teachers will have PPE to make sure that themselves, as well as their families and pupils, uh, and pupils' families, of course, are all safe? We will be setting out in our operational guidance uh, requirements around PPE and we will be working with our local authorities to ensure that that guidance is implemented when more students go back to school. 
Oh, Tom, I, I've been told that I can have one final question from Tom. I'm so sorry, Tom, if, if we've rushed you. Very sorry. Yeah, I, was, I was hoping for a short breath to get my second question in, but uh, alas, no. But thank you very much indeed for taking the second. And it was following up on what you were saying about people being kind. Um, sensible people will be listening to you and, and will listen to what you've had to say. How do you get through to thoughtless people in communicating the government's messages? Uh, gosh, my goodness me. If I had an answer to thoughtlessness, I, I wouldn't just be the education minister, would I? Uh, I we are very clear as a government that where at all possible, people can, should stay at home. But we recognise that uh, everybody is trying their very best to respond to the circumstances they're in. And as I said earlier, you know, we need to be kind to one another, not to jump to conclusions about what another person uh, is doing, and just to think and be a bit thoughtful uh, and to ask the question, if your immediate response is to criticise, to stop and think, what would I do if I found myself in a situation? And, and, and we will, as a government, continue to reiterate these messages of, 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 being, of being mindful that perhaps some people's lives are different to yours and therefore they need to do slightly different things within the confines of the rules that, of course, apply to each and every one of us. Thank you very much, uh, Tom. And